Um, as we go through the panel, if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, please email us at research at uc.edu. That's research at uc.edu, and I'll try to work them in uh, because these are the true experts. We're going to have uh, several industry leaders on this panel, and we're going to have some short presentations from each of them at the end of the panel. So if you stick around, you'll get like a two or three minute presentation from each of them just to see how their products work and how they're actually solving this problem uh, of, of illiteracy. So I'm going to introduce our panelists now. Um, first, we have Renee Seward. Renee is an associate professor of communication design at the University of Cincinnati, right here, and she's the creator of a startup called Seward Design. She's actually created her own font. It's really very cool. The award-winning software service uses visual cues to help children understand phonics and improve reading comprehension. And Renee is a digital futures lab leader, so we're excited to have her here too. Mike Dalson, she he's a principal group product manager at Microsoft Education. Mike is responsible for Microsoft's inclusive classroom product strategy and Microsoft's immersive reader set of products, which helps students with dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, as well as non-native speakers and emerging, emerging readers. The immersive reader has 23 million monthly active users across all apps and platforms. It's incredible. We've got Kent Knipe. He's vice president of engineering with Learning A to Z. All teachers have heard of Learning A to Z, a literacy-focused pre-K to six education technology provider. Its products uh, bl blend traditional teaching, teacher-led instructor instruction with technology-enabled resources to make teaching more effective and efficient. And they practice more accessible and personalized assessment of more strategic and automated learning. Uh, the company's products are used by more than seven million students in more than 170 countries. It's incredible. And last but not least, we have Melissa, Mayer, um, Melissa Weber Mayer. She's the director of the Ohio Department of Education's Office of Approaches to Teaching and Professional Learning. Melissa is charged with leading the state of Ohio's literacy improvement efforts. Through various coordinated initiatives, the state has invested heavily in improvement of language and literacy instruction. These initiatives uh, support a common mission, ensuring that all school districts effectively teach all children to read. And what I love about having Melissa on this panel is she can tell you what a policymaker is thinking about these kinds of issues. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, appreciate all of you being on here with us. Um, you know, so as I mentioned before, digital futures, what the whole premise of it is to really solve problems that matter and, and what better problem than getting kids to read and solving this illiteracy divide. So I'm going to come to all of you on this, this one question, uh, but first I'm going to start with you, Renee. How did C-Words and how did you come to understand this issue of literacy and what methodology, how do you specifically tackle this challenge? Yeah, sure. I would say that arriving at this problem was twofold. It started with me being in graduate school and taking a course on experimental typography, which is how you put words and letters on a page to help someone understand. That class was challenging me to think about how that intersected with language. But on another level, I had a dear friend whose son came home talking about his frustration and learning to read and taking tests, and he's describing his experience. And I just had these two worlds, and I wanted to figure out how to bring them together and how to use the knowledge that I understand inside of communication design and design research to help because I have realized um, from looking at the research that there are strategies that we have used as graphic designers that could possibly be employed to help teach some early reading skills. So it started there and I began partnering with educators, educational psychologists to work together to figure out how do we take the sciences from our two fields and start tackling this problem in different ways. So is that personal connection there that, that got you into it? That's really interesting. Um, I'll, Mike, I'll go to the same question. Uh, talk to you about that. Microsoft and you personally, how does it affect, uh, how do you come to this issue personally, but then also as an organization and what are you doing to solve it? Yeah, so I would, it's interesting for me personally, I sort of fell into this on accident, but in a, in a happy accident. So the background is about five years ago, uh, Microsoft has what's called a global hackathon where anyone in the company can work on any project they're passionate about for a week and build prototypes and experiment. And so I was working on the education team and I had done a little bit with dyslexia, but there was a group of people across Microsoft. We had uh, reading PhDs, we had assistive technology experts, speech pathologists and other folks. And we all got together for a project and we said, what if we took the latest science and research around reading but focused inclusively on dyslexia as our core customer type. And we took some of these technologies and built a little simple prototype 
uh, that now uh, the little baby's all grown up and now that little prototype is the immersive reader. And it, it actually won the Microsoft Hackathon five years ago. And then it was funded to be built out much more broadly. And so that's where I think and that's the, the origin story. But as a company, what's been really fascinating and, and, and pretty amazing in my, in my opinion, our CEO Satya Nadella came in about six years ago and he really fostered culture change at our company. And inclusion and accessibility is a huge cultural piece of what we do. We focus deeply on accessibility uh, and inclusive technologies. And he actually has, uh, he has a son who is uh, nonverbal uh, and has cerebral palsy and he has a daughter with uh, learning differences. And so for him personally, I think it was pretty impactful that we really focus on including everyone. And so I think across the company, things like immersive reader and many other inclusive technologies are fully supported from the CEO on down. That's fascinating. Okay. Can, you tell, can you tell us a little bit of how immersive reader works if for those that are not familiar with it? Sure. Uh, again, the concept was if we focus inclusively on dyslexia as our core customer, these same technologies and these same techniques would benefit all readers, right? It, that's, that's the power of inclusive design. And you design for one, but you can you can focus uh, for large numbers of people. So, for example, we take some some basic things. We do things like text to speech and word and line highlighting, uh, which is not revolutionary or new, but this is now uh, part of many and free in many Microsoft products. So, text to speech is an example. We break down words into syllables, and we can highlight different parts of speech like nouns and verbs and adjectives. We can do things like change the way the page colors, the sizes of the font, the sort of the visual layout. And then we can also do things like focus the line, like a reading ruler where you can just focus the line so you're reading one line at a time. We have a visual dictionary or a picture dictionary, so clicking on different words and giving an image. And then the other part that's really powerful is translation. So we can translate in real time in over 70 languages. So I can open up a page in Word, let's say, have the immersive reader, translate to say Spanish, click on different words, read the words out loud in Spanish, um, and do all sorts of sort of manipulations between languages and read aloud and syllables. And you can choose to use one, three, or all of those capabilities at the same time. So it's, it's personalized. We have kindergartners using this all the way through higher ed, all the way through corporate lawyers, because it turns out dyslexia is not something you outgrow. <laughs> Uh, that is something that affects up to 15% or more of the human population. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Kent, I'll turn to you and I'm same question to you. Um, I, I know you're very passionate about this issue of reading. Uh, we've talked on the phone and I want to hear your story. Well, so I come up through the engineering ranks and, you know, Bob Hall founded our company in, in 2000. Uh, his idea was simply to put a, a bunch of great books in teachers and kids hands. Um, and that evolved as technology kind of caught up to his vision to provide, uh, you know, digital access, meet the students where they are. And I have to say for me personally, you know, I visit classrooms, I watch the kids using, using the tools and it, it's spectacular. I mean, they just, you can see the growth, right? And uh, so now, you know, as technology keeps moving, we find ourselves pivoting into mobile and, you know, a lot more, particularly now, uh, distance learning. And so it's really great to watch the, the reading instruction grow from there. That's great, thanks. And Melissa, so you come from the same world I come from. These are, these are in, we're talking innovators and policy and people that are trying to solve this issue from the uh, private sector, which is great. I come from the policy world too. That's, that's kind of my background in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, I, I know I worked on the Ohio's third grade reading guarantee, so it's something that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. I wanted to know how you came to this issue um, then, you know, state two and just see what you guys think about it from a policy standpoint. Sure. Thanks, Jay. Um, so I, I, my, well, my background is, is in education. I've worked in three different states in, in all um, high poverty areas um, in, in Chicago and Columbus and in New Jersey. Um, uh, so I've always worked with struggling readers. I was a struggling reader. I have a child who struggled to learn how to read. So I kind of came to the table where this is just something that's always been my passion about. Um, you know, how do we 
how do we help everyone to be successful? So in Ohio, now my position at the department um, and my, my studies um, in, in university through my uh, PhD focused on literacy for early and middle childhood. And uh, with that, I'm now being at the department and working on policy for the past four years, what we've done is we've tried to highlight literacy as a lever for school improvement. Um, and within that lever, we're really looking at um, in, in Ohio having a common language and looking at how we can increase language and literacy outcomes for children birth through grade 12. Now that's in a that's a regular world, not even in the world that we're in, I should say regular like this, right? Um, a world that we're in right now. And so what we've been doing is trying to build our educators capacity to be able to do that. So I'm happy to hear the, my colleagues on the phone talk about tapping into educational psychologists and speech and language pathologists and, and as experts that know really the science behind how you learn how to read and you're tapping into those experts when you're when you're creating supports for educators. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to hear that. Um, so what we've done in Ohio too is, is thinking about um, you know, how do we identify proper assessments for children so that we can really pinpoint where the difficulties are, how we analyze that data, uh, what, um, how we use that data to identify evidence-based strategies and practices to tie that specifically to, and I think it was Kent at the end, talked about personalizing learning for children. So how do we really make sure that it is personalized and it is what that child needs? And when I say child, I'm talking about children all the way through 12th grade, uh, probably and beyond <laughs> up to, to you know, the P, P to 20. Um, and then um, thinking about how those evidence-based practices are built around the science of reading. What does science tell us? What does current research tell us? How do we meet the needs of all learners, uh, which are students with disabilities, um, are, you know, are students at risk for having dyslexia, are English learners, et cetera. Um, and then what high quality instructional materials are out there for teachers to use and what training is there for teachers to learn how to use and embed those instructional materials. And then finally addressing that whole system, right? That multi-tiered system of supports for, uh, for our children. So what is what resources and, and, and uh, work, what things are out there to support the core instruction for all children and then intervention as you move to, you know, children might need more of one thing or, um, you know, et, et cetera. So I'll stop there, but that's kind of, that's kind of the big picture of where Ohio is as far as um, working with districts and, and providing guidance, you know, through policy. Appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to stay with you for this question here, the next one. So I want to separate out for a second, this pandemic that we're in um, and the unique challenges that it presents us uh, because it certainly doesn't. I want to come back to that in a second. But when you as a policymaker are talking to educators just in general about getting kids to read, um, and I know that we have uh, this third grade reading guarantee in Ohio and other states have things similar to that too. How does a policymaker like you have those conversations? What challenges do you hear from educators? Then also, as an addendum that, since this is a real ed tech forum too, how do you see that teachers are using education technology? Because I think that's going to be to the rest of the time as they go through this too. Through your lens. Sure. So many, many of the things we hear are pertaining to some of those. Oh, I think I'm on. Am I on mute? Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> many of many of the challenges are related to the things that I mentioned, right? How do I we hear um, you know, not just from teachers in classrooms that are worried about their their children, but principals that are worried about supporting their teachers. So we get um we get questions around, you know. How am I going to meet third grade reading guarantee policy um, when I'm not? I don't have these children in front of me, um, and and I don't I can't interact with them from you know the start of the school day to the end of the school day, right? Because of of our, our different ways of, of logging in. Um, so we um, what we're hearing is that you know many of our teachers, you know, if they're not mm -hmm. if they weren't already like an e-learning teacher, their confidence, we need to build their confidence in how to use technology in order to meet the needs of their of their learners. The other thing we we hear a lot of, you know, we want in the from spring was, you know, we heard a lot of, of comments like, well, there's no new learning. We're just going to practice the learning that we already have. Well, we, we have to continue to provide new learning to our children, right? We have to 
and you know ensure that they have access to grade level text and challenging tests that we're building their background knowledge. And so now the questions come to us on, okay, now how do we do this? And what does it look like in remote settings? And what does it look like for children who, who, um, who don't have access to technology or have access to technology for this amount of time during the day? And those are, the, those are some of the biggest challenges that we're hearing um, from the teachers and then from families and, and you know, uh, students, we're hearing that they're not confident in, in using the equipment that they've been given. We've had a lot of districts work very hard and uh, and um, community members to get devices in the hands of families and students as well as hotspots. But then there's that whole learning curve of of how do I turn it on and where do I go and keyboarding and all of these other things to get to you know to make sure that the learning can be effective and that's not getting in the way. So so it kind of runs the gamut of you know how do I teach the science of reading to a struggling reader? How do I provide intervention? And then how do I also support parents to, to continue that support when I, as the teacher, are not engaging in the child for a typical amount of time that a school day would be? So, uh, Ken, I want you to play off that a little bit, too, if you could, in terms of the accessibility to some of these products um, and, and actually the, the hotspots and Internet. It, it, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I actually spoke with some educators uh, in uh, Oregon and. They were talking about trying to provide those access right um, to the families that don't have technology. They don't have a laptop. They don't have an internet. Um, so, you know, the school districts are all having to tackle that problem individually, right? There isn't a there isn't a set solution at the state level. Sometimes not even at the district level. So, it's a big challenge. Um, it's great that we have a lot of digital resources that we can, you know, put those, you know. Put the kids into a nice learning path, but you have to get through the technology. We don't want the technology to be the thing, right? We want it to be the the lever that they use to learn. Renee, I know you work uh, inside the Cincinnati Public Schools and some other places too. Any thoughts on this uh, subject here? Yeah, I think that one of the learnings um, that I've seen is that. Um, even having the technologies in the school, making sure that they're working efficiently in the schools sometimes is a barrier, especially when you're in inner city schools and it goes down because they can have a great plan. The teacher can have a great plan. And then when the technology uh, Wi Fi and all of that goes down, then you have to have an alternative. So making sure that the infrastructure is there to stand for in school and at home as well. And what are the tools that also work with the teacher so that she can continue, he or she can continue to work face to face and hands on with them because the technology is the tool that aids the teacher and not solely the learning device. You know, the teachers are the key. Mike. Um, Microsoft's an incredibly well resourced company. We all know that too. How do you approach this issue of accessibility at, at the company for, for just regular to everyday users? Yeah, I mean, something that I've worked on beyond immersive reader, uh, we like to call the inclusive classroom. So I, the way I categorize that, I, I like to sort of tell this story. I talk to a lot of school leaders, technology leaders in education, uh, district administrators. And maybe five years ago, whenever I would go in, if you said uh, the title of the talk, or I'd come in and say, I'm going to talk about accessibility. That word is very linked historically to things like, oh, you're talking about blind and low vision users or deaf and hard of hearing people. And they would sort of do something along the lines of, oh, oh, great, accessibility. Go talk to Frank. He works in the basement. He does all of our assistive technology stuff. And they'd like shuffle you away because we're going to go over here talk about education things. And when I reframed it around the inclusive classroom, we're going to talk about inclusive reading, writing, math, and communication. Who cares about that? <laughs> it, you'd have a very different response. And so that is the way we frame it is like, these are inclusive technologies. They're going to help all people with writing, all people with math or reading or communication. Yes, it might help some people more than others or differently, but these, these are gonna benefit all of your students. And so that is how we think about it. The other thing we talk about a lot is my, uh, my, four, my four catchphrase, I like to say built-in, mainstream, 
non-stigmatizing, which is key, and free. A lot of people think Microsoft costs money because they're kind of in the 2011 era. Microsoft is only Windows and it costs a lot of money. And you know, we don't we use browsers or we use Macs, so clearly we can't use Microsoft. Um, that's the old 2011 Microsoft. That was maybe true. But uh, welcome to the year 2020. Everything's free. Everything works on all devices, and it's mainstream and it's non-stigmatizing. So, start part of our goal is when it's built in to the free version of Word or Microsoft Teams or the browser, then no one cares. It's not stigmatizing because a lot of kids uh, they would rather go without than to stand out. If you've ever heard that phrase. Like, oh, I don't want to use this special software because I, I, it's going to look weird to my friends and I, I don't want to do that. And so our, our sort of philosophy is, you know, when it's built in and non-stigmatizing, uh, it's software that's used in the workplace, it's software that's used in higher ed, it's software that's used in schools, then no one cares if you're using Word and you're using a couple of extra features in Word or if you're using Microsoft Teams for collaboration with all your colleagues and these technologies are accessible and built in. And so we found that actually has quite a psychological shift in how students think about these things. Uh, it's, it's subtle, but it's actually pretty impactful. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And you're seeing this in a lot of different areas where we're as a society trying to make things uh, okay, uh, when you, especially mental health, but, but all these kind of places. So I think it's a pretty common theme and I think it's really interesting that you bring that up. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and, and bring it more to the present right now. Uh, we're in the midst of something that's been unprecedented in this country with this pandemic, and it's really reshaping how everyone does business, everyone thinks about things. Melissa, I want to go to you first. Uh, I mean, you're in the business at the end of the day of teaching kids how to read, how to learn, um, and at the end of the day, solving, prob solving this huge problem. Um, how has this pandemic uh, affected your work as a policymaker, but also educators and what they're dealing with um, in this really crazy time. Okay. Well, as, as a policymaker, you can you can imagine that the um, the amount of documents uh, that we are being asked to create for our educational community are on a rolling basis. Each update, you know, restart documents and and documents that uh, would be, would um, you know. I, are providing support for things that would be typical legislative requirements, um, but now in a virtual setting, they look different. You mentioned the third grade work in, in Ohio and third grade is one of the states across the country that does have a policy at third grade, um, which is to catch kids uh, early uh, in kindergarten and who are not on track and, and intervene early so that by third grade, they, they are you know proficient readers. Although much like other states, we have a promotion score that is still not a proficient score. It's a promotion score to get them into fourth grade, but knowing that we are still passing kids into fourth grade that haven't reached the proficiency mark. So we're, you know, the policy has to go beyond beyond third grade. As as um, I think Mike said earlier, you know, students who who uh, are uh, diagnosed with dyslexia that that affects their whole life. So uh, from a policy standpoint, we're still trying to adjust to how do we how do we locate the students how do we assess the assessment is a big piece now that it's it's in a vir virtual settings um remote settings and then how do we provide that intervention on the education side we have since march 20th which was when our ordered school building closures happened in ohio um, have provided uh, almost 200 virtual learning sessions for teachers uh, and for principals and and within that we've had over um you know 6200 educators in Ohio uh, participate in those sessions. And just between last week and this week, we had a thousand more participate in, in you know, just a handful of sessions. And these are just the literacy sessions. These aren't the sessions that are talking about, you know, even the, just the bigger picture around um, how do we meet students' needs across the board. So, um, you know, thinking about what's happening now, it's not just how do we, how do we help children and families continue to keep, you know, moving forward on the, on their academic trajectory. But how do we help our educators shift from uh, something that they're very familiar with and confident with, with something that they're not as familiar and confident with? And so the fact that we've had, you know, in a short amount of time, that many that many educators logging in is is telling us there's a there's a need to provide not only support to children's and families, but also to our educators, including 
uh, central office, you know, central office folks and districts and building administrators. Kent, let's talk about training a little bit too. I know that we've talked a little bit before about teachers who've been, you know, uh, trained in this, uh, not necessarily not having the training to teach remotely in this uh, insane time too. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Kent. Yeah, I, mean, I think Jennifer, or sorry, Melissa made an excellent point there that um, you see teachers reaching out. They, they haven't really been trained to deliver instruction remotely. And it's very different. You know, you have students of varying, um, you know, academic learning paths. And how do you reach them when they're all remotely? And how do you know they're focused and engaged? So I think what we're seeing is a need for more professional development for teachers. Their, their job is shifting, right? What do you do if you're doing in person and remote. Um, so I think there's a lot of new pivots here that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and look, the, the reality is we don't know how long we're going to do this period either. I mean, hopefully we get out of it sometime in the next uh, six to eight months, but it may be off and on like this for a long time. Um, Renee, when you're in product development and you're really refining your product, are you thinking about the pandemic in, in a new way or to actually provide something else for students? Well, I think when we started this, we were really thinking about um, the different types of students that could be in a classroom anyway, the different levels that they're at. And so whatever tools we were making, we needed them to allow for personalized learning, right? And so we wanted really easily to give the teacher access of being able to let Johnny do this because this is what he needs and let Sally do this because this is what she needs. Um, and so then when we go into remote teaching, now really quickly, they can program out these customized lesson plans to still help them go. I think one of the bigger challenges that we run into as a small ed tech company is that um, two of our products were pitched specifically for iPads. And so now we're transitioning to make sure that they're available on any device anywhere. And our new product that we have definitely has that ability, any device anywhere to help anyone um, continue to learn assisted or unassisted, which I think is what's important because now when you're in the home setting and your mom or your dad, they still have to do their work over here. What are the activities you can give them to do to keep them growing, even though they're not access, uh, uh, accessed in like one-to-one -one teaching that you would find in a classroom? How do you keep that going until the point that they're back to that one-on-one -on -one teacher or when mom and dad can spend that time to do the one-on-one -on -one at whatever part of the day it is? It's interesting that you that that's the way in which you're thinking about this. Um, Mike, same question to you too. How has the pandemic affected your business at Microsoft in terms of how you're delivering these products, if it has at all? Yeah, I, and actually, uh, actually, to just what follow on what Renee said, in case you hear some muted piano playing in the background, um, my daughter is practicing, and it's it's. I, I'll take me a minute to have her uh, practice more quiet. So if you hear a little music, that's what it is. Um, but anyways, the, uh, for us, yeah, it actually sped up quite a few different developments in a couple different areas that we've been working on, but, but the, the pandemic sped this up and, uh, they're not necessarily all literacy related. Some of them are, but for example, we sped up and launched the social emotional learning tool in Microsoft teams that allows teachers to check in with kids on their feelings and, and, and actually gathers that how the kids are feeling in the classroom, which is a common thing that kids do in elementary school. You go in, you have the little meter of well, one to nine, uh, and that is now digitally available for a teacher to do daily or weekly check-ins, customizable, and get a pulse check on the class. Uh, other things that we've sped up are something that actually just released this morning. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And, and again, this is inclusive design and it helps in a, the most basic sense, it can help with deaf and hard of hearing uh, or non-native speakers, but it also helps with students uh, that are ADHD, dysgraphia, uh, maybe dyslexia. And that is what we call OneNote live captions. So the scenario we were, we were experimenting with, but with the pandemic, we fully invested and sped it up. Imagine that, again, this could be in, in the non-pandemic world, higher education or K through 12, students taking notes. What if the professor or the educator is up front and speaking and the student doesn't speak the same language as well and it's really hard to take notes and listen at the same time? 
or maybe I'm deaf and hard of hearing and I need real time captions. Or maybe I'm dysgraphic and I have ADHD and taking in all that information while I'm trying to take notes and listen is just too hard. So what one of the live captions does, imagine right now we were all in a session and I gave you a join code. So you're all my students. I'm the one talking over a remote here and I give you a join code in your OneNote. You add that join code. Everything that I'm saying will come into your OneNote in a little pane on the right in a real time captioning transcript. And you can choose over 70 languages. So if I'm speaking English and you speak Spanish and another person speaks Japanese in terms of listening better, they can have that captioned in their language in OneNote in real time as they're taking notes. And I can pause the transcripts and highlight those transcripts and it keeps it all in place and then I can hit play and it captures it all back up and it automatically saves the captions and the transcripts into my OneNote automatically. So every day the professor or the educator starts a session that can be saved and translated in real time. So we sped that up in the pandemic and I showed that to a mother of a dyslexic son who was a junior in high school. I showed it in early development and she actually started crying, happy tears that is. She started crying because she said, my son now has a chance to survive in college. She said in universities, I was, I didn't know how he was possibly gonna keep up and read and take notes and listen all at the same time. It's just gonna be too hard. So we believe that can be a really powerful feature for all sorts of students. And we're excited to launch the beta version of that today. Well, I'm really excited that we get to break news here. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty great for us here at UC. And the second piece too, is if uh, at the end of this uh, webcast, if your daughter could play us off with some of that great Seattle sound, um, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, any of that, we'd <laughs> okay. playing Taylor Swift right now. Yeah, I couldn't control that one. Yeah, sound, that's okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kent, I'm going to ask you too. I know we talked a little bit about the pandemic before too, but product development in, in regard to the pandemic, anything from you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we pivoted pretty quickly. Uh, we rolled out something called the connected classroom last month. Um, it's really designed uh, for personalized learning student centered learning path. Um, it's got a self evaluation. Um, you know, instructional goal sets, lesson guides, um, st all standard aligned organized by grade. And the idea was. Let's get teachers everything they need in 1 place, right? So that they can deliver it remotely. So we went really fast. That wasn't even a product idea four months ago, right? And it's already out there. Fantastic. Um, all right. I want to talk a little bit about how all of you involve parents and kids directly. And, and I know Mike talked about a little bit in the last story, which was fantastic. But in terms of getting feedback from your your um, in terms of what your product development is going to be, but Melissa, I'm going to start with you. Um, I know you deal a lot with educators and for, with superintendents and other folks like that too. But how about parents and kids? How, what's the interaction? How does it also? Yeah, so we have a, a parent engagement um, project happening with the Ohio State University. It's more working with our regional supports to, so that they can build, they can work directly with our district. Now during the pandemic, it, it's been it's been a little different um, because they haven't they're not quite as fast as Kent is as far as developing uh, thing, things that quickly. Um, but what we do hear um, directly at the department from parents are their concerns about we hear more. We hear mostly from parents who have students who struggle with learn how to learning how to read, and also parents whose children are gifted. Right, and, and and want to move forward to accelerate their learning. So we're hearing both about like how can how can how can they help? And one one of the areas that we're working with our districts and our parents with, and I just heard Mike and Renee, you know, kind of talk about this. And I think Renee, you said assisted or unassisted, is thinking about too, um, you know, how there's an equity issue um, when you don't have a teacher sitting in front of you all the time, and you are 100% dependent on that teacher for all of your instruction. And so if I am a struggling reader and I'm typically in front of my teacher for intervention for X amount of time, and, and I haven't been taught how to be a, an independent learner or a critical thinking so I can work these things out on my own so I can be unassisted, as Renee said, we, we 
equity issue as far as how, who can access the, the tools that you are all creating if, if, they're, if they're not a confident independent learner. So a lot of the questions we get are from our parents is well, how do I how do I help my child right and and um, do be able to work independently while I'm doing my job right when, and even sharing the computer because I might need to take that computer to do my job which means my child doesn't have that computer to do their job at the moment so there there's lots of different things that are that are happening as as far as the department is working. Um, on, a, on a big project that um, is titled Remote Ed X um, that is aligned to our each child, our future, and all of our, our strategies. And that is, you know, all of the things we're talking about here, which is, you know, getting the devices, engaging families, trying to help parents, um, you know, also help meet the needs of students because, you know, the parent, our parents, they're not educators. And all of a sudden, uh, as of March 20th, they were all, you know, now you're your child's teacher. Um, and so the, those are those are all kind of the new moving pieces and parts that are happening. You would think that we had all this time from March until the start of school in August to figure it out, um, but we haven't. So we're still figuring it out as we're moving forward and relying on you know, learning from the, our, our, our colleagues on the on the webinar here as to you know, how fast can you develop things and how fast can we teach adults how to use these things so they can be successful with children. Renee, I'm going to ask the same question of you too. Um, how do you deal with parents and actually kids too in, in solving this problem? Yeah. I would like to say that our process is very like co design with uh, teachers and educators and parents. We've put out prototypes really quickly. Uh, I love the time that I can go spend in the classroom and just observe how uh, the teacher and the student is using them, hear what they said, hear what the pain parts are, and go back to the lab and make it better and bring it out for a next round. So I think that uh, the conversation and how they used it um, is very important to me because I think that the tools we're creating it's important that it fits like a glove for all parties if it's like a glove for the teacher if it's like a glove for the student and if it's like a glove for a parent and you don't really want to know that you have it on you just want to be learning the information out of it and i think as we um, move forward here of understanding what are the core tasks to meet the standards and how in different ways can that be automated to help give assisted learning to a student so that if a parent doesn't really feel like they have the confidence in knowing how to do it, this tool is going to guide the student one by one and going on so that the parent can be in the role that they like to be. Woohoo, keep going, you doing it, you know, type of role. Like that's where I feel comfortable. <laughs> uh, that, that is such a great answer. Um, all right, I'm going to switch gears. So we, we're getting some questions from the audience. Uh, and remember, it's research at uc.edu if you've got a question. But I, I've got a one that's, that I thought was pretty interesting from Nancy Jennings. How do you address parent and teacher concerns about excessive use of tech among children that is further enhanced in the pandemic? Tech limits and restrictions have been highly recommended by pediatricians and others. So you're all in the technology business and the education business. Um, Mike, I'm gonna go to you first on this thing. Uh, clearly that's, that's something we wanna limit. We wanna make sure that kids aren't just in front of uh, the screen all day, but they kind of have to be in front of the screen, especially now. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, not only that's a wrestling with that one at home just as much as as a, at work, and so I, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're using the screen for. Like it, an interesting statistic again, I, I've read this where I think right now it's estimated that. It was a big poll by NPR. I think they said 20% of students with special uh, that special needs or special education students felt like they were able to get the services they needed from the school during remote learning. So one out of five, that's, that's pretty brutal. And so with things like assistive technology, that actually at home can be very helpful because again, when these are built in and mainstream, non-stigmatizing free, and obviously there are equity issues because not every student can get technology at home and that's something we have to work on but at least students that can access some form of technology at home for assistive tech can use those tools to try and keep up because the parents now can often have to go into the state of helping with the assistive technology where the educator used to which is still difficult but at least there's something we've also seen and we've said this publicly we saw 
a 10x, so you know, over a thousand percent increase in usage of immersive reader during the pandemic. And massive amounts of that were at home. So what that tells us is that with certain type of screen time, that can be still helpful, especially for students that really need that or require that. And that's not just for immersive reader, that could be speech to text. That could be inclusive math technologies. That could be like we talked about real-time captioning and translation technologies at home that uh, what we've seen is a, a speeding up of adoption of some of these where there might've been some red tape in the past to try out or use new assistive technologies. And the pandemic has torn down that red tape. And you know, at scale, a lot of people are saying, well, I'm at home, I have to try these technologies or else I won't be able to be included at all. So it's a, it's kind of a balance. Uh, obviously, I would prefer, you know, less screen time for my, even for my own daughter, but at the same time, some of it might be required for people to even engage in the education process. I completely agree. It's, it's a, it's a challenge for all of us. Um, I know I've got a six year old at home too, and, uh, I want him less watching Netflix, but, but these are real tools that we can use to help get him to read fast. So it's, it's interesting. Um, Kent, same question to you too. Have you thought about this issue? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We all suffer from it, right? I call it, uh, you know, a little bit of technology fatigue. So if I'm in front of my screen all day, um, I don't want to be in front of the screen at night too. Um, I think kind of dovetails in with Melissa's point about parent engagement. If we could give the parents some guidance, then the students don't have to spend all their time in front of technology. So, hey, out in the backyard, let's see if we can find some bugs that's part of our science unit, right? Um, but the parents don't know that. So there needs to be an intersection, I think, between the teaching in the classroom and the parents helping sort of mentor their students. Um, and that's gonna help kind of alleviate that technology overload. Thanks, Ken, appreciate that. All right, so we've talked a lot about, and we've, we've touched on this next thing that I wanna, wanna make sure that we all have some kind of sense of, um, of these specific granular issues that sometimes uh, impede a kid's ability to read, uh, whether it's ESL, English as a second language, or dyslexia, or low vision. Um, Ken, I'm going to stay with you too. Have any thoughts around those kinds of things? It's not just the regular kid that just we're just trying to get them to read, but they've got a very specific problem. I know Mike's talked a little bit about dyslexia before in, in one of his other answers, but I want to get, give you a chance, Ken. Yeah, I think Mike's got some some great answers in this area, but um... You know, one of the challenges with technology is accessibility, right? So can I make technology available to everybody? It could be a socioeconomic problem. It could be a disability, a dyslexia, or a um, you know, low vision. So now, when we're also heavily reliant on remote learning, how do we make sure that all those tools, all those resources can be put in every child's hands? And there's not a great answer. I mean, there's been a big push in recent years for web technologies to do the uh, it's WCAG 2.1 compliance, make sure your tools are accessible, make sure they can be read by a screen reader. But it's more than that too, right? Um, it's access to devices. Um, to, to Mike's point, you know, great tools that will let you unlock whatever the content is. I think it's an important piece. So I'd really like to see, you know, all companies um, spends more time on that, spends more time worrying about every student. Uh, we have kind of a, a journey that, that learning A to Z is on where, you know, we've spent a couple of years getting audits done of our sites and remediating those issues because we do care, right? We do want everything to be available to every kid. Appreciate that, Ken. Renee, you heard the uh, C words was founded because of dyslexia, really, at the end of the day. So how do you think about these other issues too, these other specific impediments? Yeah, I was going to say the well, everything that I do started with Caleb and Caleb suffers from dyslexia. And as I stood there and listened to him talk about his frustration, while I don't have dyslexia early on, it was a struggle for me to learn to read and write. So I empathized and then I began realizing if there is knowledge that I have inside of typography and if the technology inside of developing fonts in any way could be helpful in giving more access to people who are having phonic or 
for decoding issues, then I'm all about that, right? And so a lot of the new tools that we're developing, we're figuring out how do we use new font technology to make these fonts smart enough so that they are the unexistent accessibility tool. So as you're reading anything you want on any device, if you're struggling to decode, let the font help you. Um, give you that aid, right? Let the font be the tutor or the helper or the reserve teacher until you can get back to that tutoring session or the classroom session to help push you out further. Fascinating, thank you. Um, we've got another question for the audience. Uh, so this is around collaboration and, and the question specifically say, would you consider collaborating with each other to help kids learn how to read? Um, I wanna, uh, Mike, I'll, I'll go to you on this. Um, we're, I'm sitting here at a research university. The whole basis of it is to collaborate, to break down silos, to try to solve problems that matters. We've, we've said before, how do you view collaboration with policymakers, with uh, research universities, those kinds of things at Microsoft and other companies too? Yeah, no, that, that's actually a great topic. And so with Immersive Reader, we have worked with, we have internal reading research experts, but we've actually been working with top external reading research experts for years. And the, our whole thing is let's take the latest science and research and let's try and build that into software. We actually even put up a web page on the Immersive Reader research that's gone in, citing all the different research articles. Some of them are 50 years old. <laughs> Some of them are 10 years old, some of them are relatively new. And so that's a key part of what we do. But for example, and I'm not gonna share what the details are, but we're working on some next generation reading technology right now. And as part of that, we have got um, sort of consulting with some of the top, we have people like Timothy Shanahan or Dr. Mark Seidenberg or Tim Rosinski or some of the top leading dyslexia experts. We even, Ali Shaywitz, uh, Fumiko Haft. So they are some of the leading people in the field and we consult with them and get their feedback early on because the last thing we wanna do is put out software where it was a bunch of Microsoft employees in a dark closet, like thinking about stuff. <laughs> we actually wanna make sure this has been vetted and we want the top researchers to come to us and say, that's a terrible idea. Don't you dare ever do that, right? Great, I wanna hear that very early on. And so that is something that we are always uh, working with the top people in the field on. Kent, same question Kent, to you. Sir. How do you, how do you collaborate? Yeah, I, I mean, I align almost 100% with what Mike's saying, right? Um, we reach out to experts all over the place. Uh, we're always paying attention to the new research. We want our products to be effective and we're not the ones to make that decision, right? There's a lot of people, a lot of smart people, um, working on things like how do we make third grade students all be proficient readers and we want to follow that that science follow that that research and build it into our products but we also collaborate with other companies too so you know we we think best in breed is the way to go because we want the, we want the students to succeed uh, you know obviously we're we're companies and we want to make money too but at the heart of it it's about inspiring you know joy and curiosity um and in you know comprehension that's that's what we're all about that's great that's fantastic so um melissa you're a policymaker and you're kind of somewhat beholden to the state legislature the governor congress funds uh from from all those folks there too and and policy they set I, I'm curious, look, if you had a magic wand and you could just say, I'm going to get rid of these barriers one day or change some policies, what would you do um, if you were that queen for a day to say, this is how we get the kids to read? <laughs> well, queen for a day, let's see. Um, I, I, well, I'd ask for time, <laughs> but time, I don't know where I have control over that. But I think if it's important for Educa educational leaders and teachers to have critical conversations. And I think sometimes we don't take the time to have the critical conversations. Um, everybody on the on the call today talked about how important, you know, that is uh, with with, you know, stakeholders or our customers, you know, our, our families and children are our customers, you know, at the department. And when we think about making legislative policies, so uh, um, I would I would think about, uh, you know, ways to identify by um, appropriate assessments when we're thinking about teaching kids how to read, um, how to um, 
then plan for instruction, how to uh, identify those evidence based practices and then and then using high quality instructional materials so that the teaching can be can be effective. And I, I think I think one of our one of our biggest pieces that we've learned in Ohio over the past four years is the importance of really supporting our educators and not just the classroom teachers, but as I've said before, the system that that supports um, you know, the educators so that they can be successful. And that includes our parents and it includes our community. All right, we'll make sure that the governor sees this right away. So yes, thank you. Um, that would also require more money, Jay. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I know where it always comes down to I get that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're we're nearing the end of the conversation. First of all, I, I want to thank all of you, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we do the right send off with Mike's daughter, uh, daughter's music at the end. But um, five years from now, for the three uh, uh, you know private sector folks here, I really want to know where you see your companies. How are you seeing the innovations going um, in terms of this specific uh, topic of edu of ed tech, helping kids to read? Uh, Kent, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, where do you see your company five years from now? I think we're going to continue to try and meet students where they live. Um, I wouldn't be surprised in five years if the you see the death of the web browser. Um, you know, more personalized. Uh, right now, it's mobile, but uh, that technology could be wearable in the future. Um, I think we'll be focusing on that, but at the same time, trying to make sure that the students are actually really paying attention to learning not so much the technology. So we'll continue to look at that research that, that Mike and uh, Melissa were talking about. And, uh, you know, we're just gonna try and make it painless and joyful. Thanks, Ken, appreciate that. Mike, um, when these the educators and the parents are watching this at home and, and five years from now, what are they gonna see from Microsoft in this field? Well, I think you're gonna see, I like to tell people that, um, we're just getting started on these things because technology is rapidly increasing, whether it is text to speech, speech to text, or reading technologies. So I think you're gonna, I like to say there's a tidal wave coming and, and I like to say Microsoft is a scale company. Uh, oh, there goes my dog. Uh, Microsoft is a scale company. And so we can invest at billions of people scale. So that's going to be new languages, that's going to be more devices, that's going to be trying to get this in the hands in the mainstream audience. And so we really want to make sure that as many people as possible have access to this. Again, that built-in, mainstream, non-stigmatizing free, you're going to see that coming across reading, writing, math, and communication. So uh, our biggest challenge now is people don't know what we're doing. So hopefully, uh, as we scale these things out and make improvements, I wish I could share some of them. But you know, uh, right now under confidentiality, I can't. But you should be paying attention because our whole inclusive and accessible platform is something that we're deeply focused on culturally as a company. And I've also enjoyed getting to know your entire family here too. Uh, your dog. <laughs> yeah. your dog. Um, Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Should introduce my wife. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's bring them all on. Um, Renee, I'm going to uh, give you the last word here as our resident. You see, started with us, and we're, you're ending as our resident UC uh, team leader here. Uh, same question. You're a startup, so you're literally in the infancy of your products. But five years from now, where do you want to be? Yeah, I was going to say we're a startup, so I would like to see this startup full of a diverse set of people that's diverse in discipline, diverse in um, knowledge, diverse in backgrounds. And we're in a hands on way trying to figure out how do you use technology that becomes a, a window transparent window that gives people access to understanding and growing their knowledge. Um, I think that's yeah. Sounds great. Uh, okay. Look, Mike Thalson, Renee Seward, Ken Knipe, Melissa Weber Mayor, I want to thank all of you for joining us on this uh, conversation. Uh, again, it's a, it's a conversation that matters in, in, in a lot of people's lives. Um, and it's a problem. It's a, it's a conversation to actually help people uh, in more ways than just reading. And that's what I don't think people quite understand. So we're going to sign off now. And we've got a few videos here uh, from the three products, just so you can take a look at it. it. It should take about 10 minutes to get through them all. But so you kind of understand what our panelists were talking about there, too. Thank you all very much. We'll be in touch. And uh, this video will be archived so you can watch it posterity and share it around. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>